From ZTN Studios in Harare, Zimbabwe, welcome to State of the Nation. This broadcast is brought to you by Zimpapers TV Network. And today we're continuing our discussion, the National Peace and Reconciliation Commission Visibility and Awareness Campaign. In today's discourse, we will focus on the conflict prevention, management, resolution and transformation thematic committee. The National Peace and Reconciliation Commission is mandated to receive and investigate complaints from the public in instances where conflicts arise rise as a result of human rights violations as provided for in the Constitution and the NPRC Act. Citizens have the constitutional right to approach the NPRC to lodge complaints. And joining us today to discuss this and more is Commissioner Patience Chiradza. Welcome to State of the Nation. Thank you. Good evening, viewers. And of course, if you have any comments or views on our show today, please contact us via our Facebook page, Zim Papers TV Network, or via our Twitter handle at ZTN News. Now, Commissioner, you're chairperson of the Conflict Prevention, Management, Resolution, and Transformation Thematic Committee. What are the functions of this committee? Um, thank you um, for that question. Um, th this committee really is uh, meant to focus on issues of conflict prevention and non-recurrence. If you look at the mandate of the commission, almost half of the mandate speaks to issues of preventing disputes, prevent preventing conflicts from arising in the future, putting in place mechanisms for early detection of areas of potential conflict. So this is the focus of the thematic area as guided by the mandate of the commission. So you find that we have uh, this thematic committee comprising of members who are not uh, commissioners, members of staff of the commission, but they are representatives from our stakeholders because we believe that in terms of the work of peace building, Every, part, every Zimbabwean citizen or every stakeholder has, has to play a part. So this thematic committee is multi-stakeholder. We have representatives from um, civil society. We have representatives from the political parties that are currently in parliament. Um, we have people with disabilities represented, the police, government departments, the churches. So it's a multi-stakeholder committee and we've broken it into two teams, one team for the northern region and one team uh, in the, for the southern region to make sure that no issues are left unattended to if the, the, the committee is centralized. So that is the nature of the thematic committee that we are talking about, which is focusing on how do we work together as Zimbabweans to prevent uh, conflicts. But I must say that in general, conflicts are part of us because we are different. We have different ways of thinking, different ideologies, different understandings. They will be part of us and conflicts are not necessarily bad. But what becomes the issue is when then they have negative impacts on our livelihoods, on our economy, especially through violence. So the issue is then how do we then prevent the negative impact of the conflicts that we have, which are part of our day-to-day -day life. So this is the focus of this committee. Now, I understand from yesterday's um, conversation with Commissioner Masunungura that in your efforts for decentralization, you get a lot of assistance from the peace committees that you have throughout all the 10 provinces of Zimbabwe. What's the role of these peace committees and how, can, how have they been instrumental to effecting the the commission as it is okay um, the peace committees are an important uh, structure of the commission because we are trying to create platforms at local level where people are then able to sit down and deliberate around the conflicts that they experience and be able to resolve them amongst themselves local solutions to the problems that they face because if you bring in people from outside they might not have a deeper understanding of the root causes mm -hmm. of the conflicts that are happening in those communities so it's better for the people in those communities to be able to discuss their issues thoroughly and come up with strategies for resolve them then that becomes more sustainable so um, we've got three layers of peace committees that we are targeting we are going to be having a national peace committee which we are still to launch we have already launched the provincial peace committees and we are already working on launching the district peace committees. We're trying to strike a balance between 
the level at which we start because the National Peace Committee was going to take a bit longer. We decided to start at the provincial level. So this is also a multi-stakeholder platform where you have our traditional leaders are represented in those provinces that are not metropolitan. We have government departments, but the government departments then depend on the nature of conflicts that are pe peculiar to that province. So you find that in, an, in another province, you might have more maybe Minister of Mines, Minister of Lands. You go in another province, you have more of maybe Minister of Environment, depending on the nature of the conflict. So it's also up to the people to, to discuss or Minister of Education. So the government departments are there. The police are also a key stakeholder in our peace committees civil society organizations that are already doing peace building work in the different communities. The churches are part of that as well as other faith based institutions such as the Muslim community. People with, with disabilities are also part of the peace committees, youth, youth specific groups and groups that represent women because we did not want anyone to be left out of this conversation. So we launched these peace committees um, in 2019 and uh, we tr started the training of the peace committees. We've only have one province that is left, uh, which we had to put on hold because of the current uh, situation with the lockdown that we are in. But the basis of the training is really to capacitate them to be able to deal with the conflicts, but also not just to capacitate them, but to be able to enable them to create a, a rapport in which they can work together. Because remember, they are coming from different, different backgrounds, backgrounds. Mm -hmm. so they need to be able to understand each other and work together and this is a process so it was just the initial capacity building process that we've already done for the peace committees and they are already instrumental in terms of resolving conflicts at local level i will give for example um the national and central peace committee um when they had the issue of the um machete gangs coming up they quickly convened and said, how do we then intervene and assist in this process so that the situation does not escalate? Mm -hmm. So these are some of the activities that the, the peace committees are already doing in terms of when issues come out in their provinces, they are already discussing on terms of how do we then work together. And I also forgot to mention that the Minister of State for the province is represented either in their capacity as minister if they're available or someone from their office because you find that some of the issues will need the inter intervention of government from the minister's office so we felt that they're also important stakeholder to be part of this process okay i understand well based on what you've said they are essentially the gatekeepers as it were mm -hmm. <laughs> to this thematic committee and play a very vital role mm -hmm. in your execution of duties. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to hear from you, what is your thematic committee's level of expertise in this regard? Okay, in terms of the thematic committee that we have, I think we, we have uh, diverse expertise. Um, we've got the academia represented. If you look at the deputy chair for the southern region, um, the Northern Region Committee, she's from um, um, Women's University. So the, we have the academia represented. We have the church key leaders within the church, uh, seconded through um, Zimbabwe Aids of Christian denominations uh, being part of that process. We also have senior officers from the police, senior representatives from civil uh, society. So there are people who've been working in the different sectors, but with a um, inclination towards peace building so we've got quite a variety of expertise because then that will help us deal with the different issues because issues will come from all quarters but we don't stop there we also go through processes of continuous capacity building engaging with other um, 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 organizations or countries that have done the same in september we had representatives from the ghana peace committee who actually came to speak because the Ghana Peace Commission also has a similar setup of peace committees within Ghana. So they also came to share their experiences with the vice chairpersons of our peace committees because in each province, there's a commissioner which is like I chair the Manikaland Peace Committee, but there are two deputies who've been elected by the members of the peace committee so we brought in all those deputy chairpersons from all the provinces to hear the experiences from the different countries from ghana and kenya was 
they have similar setups, how have they done it, what can we learn from them. So in terms of expertise, we are also looking at continuously also building the capacity of the committees that we have. That being said, would you, now that you've mentioned it, you have obviously taken reference from other countries on how they have dealt with conflict within their countries. Would you care to shed a bit more light on what models the Commission is using in this regard? Um, we've had a lot of learning experiences um, uh, during the time that we're waiting for our um, act to be uh, brought into law. We learned from Ghana, we learned from Kenya, we learned from South Africa, uh, Sierra Leone. But one thing that we understood is that each context is very different. Mm -hmm. So you then have to contextualize the learnings into your own situation. And also one thing that was very evident is that in most of those countries, you find that in Kenya, for example, they initially had the TJR, which was focused on the, uh, the truth and reconciliation process. And now they have a, a commission and cohesion and national integration, which is more of the peace building. And in South Africa, if you look at the um, TRC, mm -hmm. it was focused on the truth and reconciliation. But if you look at our commission, it's like a two-in-one commission. Mm -hmm. We have to issue, deal with the historical issues mm -hmm. in terms of our truth and reconciliation process. But we also have to be forward-looking in terms of how do we work around peace building, especially preventing the recurrence of the conflicts that we've had or the escalation of conflicts that are currently running or even new conflicts that will emerge. We now need to start anticipating them. So as we learn from the, the, all those different countries, we then have to say what suits the Zimbabwean context in terms of the history that we had, uh, the history of conflict. I'm sure Commissioner Masunungure sp spoke about the conflict timeline mm -hmm. that we looked at from the pre-independence into the post-independence -ind into where we are now. So from everything that we've learned, we then say what we then need to really sit down and say what works for Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. what doesn't work. Because our political situation is different, our economic situation mm -hmm. is different, even though we might be closely re related to some of the African countries. Please take us through the system, the process, mm -hmm. as it were, of conflict, um, recognizing mm -hmm. a conflict before it becomes that. What is the process of going from identifying the conflict? How do you manage it? How do you resolve it? How do you transform it? Well, um, I wish it was a linear process, but it's not because you find that um, conflicts happen at different stages. So the first thing that you also need to do is to understand at what stage is this conflict? Is it still latent? When it's latent, you are hearing, you know, simmerings, murmurings, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, you track social media. What are the people saying? You know, what is the kind of language that is being used? Or is it already an open conflict where people are in, in exchange? So then that will determine the level of inter intervention that is required. But what we are doing as a commission, we are, if you look at part of our mandate, requires us to put in place a mechanism for the early detection of potential conflict. So we are setting up a conflict early warning, early response mechanism. We've already had a learning from um, other countries as well, Kenya, already as a, a, a conflict early warning, early response system that is running. Uh, we also learned from some people who came from WANEP, where we are then saying, how do we then scientifically follow whatever is being reported in the media? How do we scientifically follow social media? But at the same time, how do we give our citizen a platform to give input into the system to say, you know what, I mean, in Muzarabani, this is what is happening. Mm -hmm. We had a sort of a small model in the uh, pre-election period with some of our stakeholders uh, from civil society where they already have platforms where people can send in messages uh, during elections to say, okay, we, this is what we are observing. There are certain people who are coming. So we then say, what does it mean mm -hmm. given the historical context? So. We are setting up that system, uh, which we are already in the starting to develop the indicators, and we are going to train uh, the nation in terms of how do they get access to the system, so that we we are then able to detect uh, areas of potential conflict 
find out which are our, our hot spots. We know sometimes because of our history of elections, especially, we know that there are certain hotspots that are obvious. Uh, but how do we then track the events to ensure that we respond on time? What but sometimes, is the ignition point yes, before it well, becomes some, Sometimes else? You, you can have a good early warning system, but mm. if it is not backed up with an effective response system, mm -hmm. it becomes useless because then the conflict will just escalate and people are going to lose their lives or their livelihoods or whatever it is. So this is um, what we are currently working on right now um, to, to ensure that we have this platform, make use of our technologies, and where... Um, Maybe people have no access to technologies. We are going to be engaging as well through our peace committees at district level to say, how can we then also ensure that they pass information into this platform? Mm -hmm. So this is one of the things that we are doing in terms of detecting areas of potential conflict. And we are quite excited about it because we are quite at an advanced stage. And I must also say that we have a technical committee that is multi-stakeholder. Our security sector is involved. Our political parties is in, uh, parties are involved. Civil society organizations are involved because some of them had platforms that they were using where people can then send in information. But the key issue is then to say, how are we using this system to ensure that we prevent the escalation of conflicts? Because that is the ultimate mm -hmm. um, end game at the end of the day. Because otherwise, you might have a beautiful system, but if you then continue in conflict and violence, it becomes Redundant useless. and yeah. co completely pointless at yeah. that point. Yes. And you're watching The State of the Nation, and we're getting to know more about the NPRC through its visibility and awareness campaign. We'll continue our discussion with Commissioner Patience Chiradza when we come back. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're still with us on State of the Nation where we're talking all things NPRC with focus on the conflict prevention management Resolution and Transformation Thematic Committee. I'm joined today by Commissioner Patience Chiraza. And before the break, you were telling us how you go through the process of identifying conflict before it happens. And the idea is you want to arrest it. You want it to stop before it becomes anything bigger than it should be. And would you be able to highlight some of the conflicts that you have addressed as a committee? Okay. Um, maybe let me put it this way. Our um, thematic committee is not focusing on addressing the conflict, but it's focusing on putting in place the mechanisms that will create a platform for all of us as citizens to work together to be able to prevent the conflicts uh, that we have. But as a commission, I can say that, um, yes, we've had inst instances where we've intervened um, in, in certain conflicts, um, um, or in the escalation of, of uh, particular uh, conflicts, um, I'm really trying not to preempt <laughs> Commissioner <laughs> Nguyen's <laughs> discussion because then that, that goes into um, the issues around healing and reconciliation mm -hmm. as well. Uh, that is also going to, to speak about when he, he comes next. But what I can safely say is that the major focus of the thematic committee is to then say, what structures do we put in place that are sustainable? Because remember, our commission has a limited lifespan. Mm -hmm. So once the life of the commission is gone, we, st we still need to have sustainable structures that can still work because they are owned by all of us mm -hmm. as a nation. So this is the f particular focus of this particular thematic committee. Now, a few months ago, one of the hottest things where the whole nation was being called to to the party, as it were, to be involved and be a part of the conversation was the national dialogue. Do you feel that is a platform where NPRC and particularly your thematic committee are essential? How do you fit into that? Okay, if uh, actually if you look at uh, the mandate of the commission, there is a part where it says um, 
the commission has to facil facilitate dialogue among political parties, groups, communities as part of the conflict prevention process. And yes, the commission has a role to play in the national dialogue process. Um, and we asked, this is why we are then, we looked at the architecture that is required for a national dialogue. We are then saying, first of all, as Zimbabweans, we need to agree what is this thing that we are saying is the national dialogue? Mm -hmm. Who is to be part of the conversation? So one of the reasons why we are then creating the platforms of the peace committees is that we want conversations that will come from the grassroots. So once we have our peace committees in place at district level, uh, we then need to then have these uh, committees um, propose agendas, issues, critical issues that they think should be part of the national dialogue. Because if, if you are having a national dialogue, you need to have an agenda. Mm -hmm. What exactly are we talking about? And what do we want to achieve at the end of the dialogue? What is the output that we want? So the process that we are working on, because we did consultations, we've been doing consultations with our stakeholders around the national dialogue. What is it? And one thing that is clear is that it's a dialogue that should involve all citizens. So what are the platforms that we can create so that people are able to speak out their views and those views are then able to be taken forward? But we also want to recognize that there have also been spaces of dialogue that have already happened or that are continuously happening among our civil society organizations, amongst our church groups, amongst our youth. So we are then saying, how do we bring all those conversations together? Because if you look at, we've been fortunate enough to be invited to some of those dialogue spaces. So what are the common issues from those dialogue spaces so that we can then bring the conversation together and make it a broader conversation that involves some of the people that might not necessarily be in those organized groups, if mm -hmm. I may use that word. So we believe that once we have our peace committees in place at local level, they then should be able to lead the conversation because we do not believe that as a commission, we should then go to the, the um, maybe I'll speak of my home area to Mondoro hmm. and then start a conversation when there are people in Mondoro who understand their, the issues that they need addressed and the issue that we, what we must then do is to facilitate a process where people, a platform where people can discuss those issues. Those issues are taken forward and are out of those issues we must be able to say at local level, what are we able to do? Mm -hmm. If there are things that we are able to do at local level, how do we do it? Mm -hmm. And then we carry on with it. What are the things that we need to take up to the next level? So this is how we envision the national uh, dialogue process, and it's something that we are still working around. I know we would have wanted to happen just like that. Just like that. Mm. But I think there are a lot of considerations also from some of the learnings that we have we've had in terms of how to properly structure the dialogue so that it comes up with sustainable results. The dialogue should even be able to continue even after the life of the commission because dialogue is what, is what is, it sustains um, peace mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Now, NPRC has a mandate to investigate mm -hmm. all human rights complaints, as it were. That can't be easy, mm -hmm. more so for you in a situation where, as chairperson, your mandate is to prevent conflict escalating. Mm -hmm. What are some of the challenges that you have experienced? Um, in the prevention work, um, or maybe if I say in the peace building work, um, the challenge is that people don't, things don't move as fast as people we might like. want or mm. the expectations that are there. Because we are working in a space where we are different, we've got different interests, different positions, different needs. Mm -hmm. So in most cases, we are, tr we are all trying to protect our interests. So it takes a lot of time to be able to build the trust that would then take us to the next step. So that is one of the challenges that comes along with the peace building work. So you find that sometimes when you think you've moved one, two, three steps, you only realize, ah, probably we are back at step one. Mm. So it needs a lot of patience. It needs a lot of long suffering, if, my, if I may use that term, to be able to continuously push the process forward. Mm -hmm. Because to understand, because everyone is trying to protect their interests and mm. their needs, no matter where you are. 
So how do you ensure that we come to a point where we unravel those interests, those positions, and focus on the needs? Because at the end of the day, the needs that we have are common if you really want to look at all the major conflicts that we experience. The, the major things that we need that we must always have that are important to us are the same. But maybe the difference is in the interests and positions that we might have around those needs. So that is one of, of the challenges that we have. And also the level of polarization that we are in as, as a nation also becomes, becomes a challenge in terms of the commitment uh, to push processes forward. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, um, I'm just thinking about, I'm not thinking about the future, I'm thinking about what needs to be the done now. now. And especially if people then think, ha, ah, there's no progress, the trust also is, is affected to say, mm -hmm. ha, but these people, you know, it's useless to be doing this process because it's not yielding us the results that we want in the space of time that we expect. So those are some of the challenges that come with this work. But for us, it, we anticipated this because our colleagues from the different commissions that came to speak to us spoke to these issues mm -hmm. as well, that they experienced them even in their own context. So the important thing is to remain resolute to what you want to achieve at the end of the day. But sometimes time will not be on your side. Of course. <laughs> and I suppose in staying resolute to what you want to do, there comes the question of particularly you receive funding from the government. And this has raised question, of course, on whether you're able to remain impartial as you deliberate as the commission. Would you care to comment on that? Okay, I think my 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 view is that um government is required by the constitution to make sure that all the commissions are up and running. And this is what our government has been doing. And the, the funding that we receive from government is really not enough. So we also get funding from development partners, especially through the Peace Building Fund. But one thing for us that has happened as a commission, as you get funding, you've got a mandate that you, you have to follow. Even with the funding that you get from government, you set your targets, which you submit. Mm -hmm in terms of we want to do A, B, C, D, E, and this is the basis on which the funds are released to you, to us, even from government or also even from our development partners. We have set the work plans, the targets of what we want to do. So as, we are, as long as we are focusing on the work plans that we set, that from which we know we've attracted funding for, then it, it will remain impartial because the focus is on, on the work that will be measured. And Fortunately for us, our strategic plan, we worked on it together with members of the public. We have stakeholders who came in to help us craft the strategic plan. Mm -hmm. And that is what we are using to get funding from government and also from the development partners. So we will then be measured in terms of that particular strategic plan. So there is no room for, for partiality because you have to focus on the work that you promised the nation that you will do. Uh, yesterday, when we met with Commissioner Masunungura, he made reference to how you have gone out of your way to ensure that political parties are fairly represented mm -hmm. within the peace committees in the, throughout the provinces. Peace. Do you believe that you are still able in that situation to maintain political um, impartiality, do you think? I believe so, because the way the, the peace committees work is that it's not like you discussions are held in different spaces. Mm -hmm. All the people will be there. The political parties will be re at the same table. So it is a platform that as a commission, we are facilitating a discussion by the local people. So our role is to facilitate a platform. So in terms of the agenda, in terms of what needs to be done, if you look at um, our first runoff when we launched the Peace Committee, each province identified critical issues that they felt as the peace committee they needed to deal with. Mm -hmm. So the commission is creating a platform for people within the province or within the district to discuss issues that pertain to them, whether they are from the political parties or, or from other institutions. And within the peace committees, it's not just the political parties, remember, you also have the church, you also have women, youth, other groups represented. Mm -hmm. So that creates a platform where even the, the impartiality of the commissioner who's chairing is checked 
mm -hmm. because it's, you have other people who are also around the table mm -hmm. in, in addition to the commission being represented. So that helps to then um, uh, keep the, po uh, the, the commission in check in terms of how it relates to the political parties. And uh, I want to give you an example. When we launched the, the peace committee in, in Bulawayo, initially we had just um, invited um, ZANU-PF and MDC. Uh, but when the peace committee met, they said, you know what, for us to be able to move forward in this province, can we invite Zapu on the table? Mm -hmm. Can we invite Mtuakaz on the table? So this is a resolution that is coming out of that particular peace committee because they understand the dynamics within their province better because they are the people who reside there. They know that for us to be able to make progress, if so-and-so is not on the table, it will not work. So that is how the peace committees work, and I think that guarantees the impartiality of the commission. The more I hear you speak of peace committees, the more I realize how wonderful uh, and I, an innovation it is in this regard as the NPRC. What qualifications do you look for? How do you qualify people as peace committees? Okay, what, what we did, um, we set out a minimum uh, criteria in terms of their understanding and commitment to peace building. Uh, that was the focus. And then we asked the different institutions to nominate their representatives to the peace committee. We set out in terms of what are the terms of reference, what will be expected mm -hmm. uh, from the peace committee members. And we sent invitations to the different institutions, the political parties, the civil society organizations, the churches, the youth groups to say, you nominate the people that we think will best represent you in this platform. So that is how then we then um, brought in the people. Hence, at the beginning, that's why I talked about capacity building. Because then we, they were nominated, mm -hmm. you know. So we then say, so we look at them, how do we then now bring them to the same level in terms of what is their mandate? What can they do? What can they not do? Where do they start? Where do they end? What are the issues that are they are going to be dealing with? Because at the end of the day, they represent the commission within the communities. Yes. So that is how the members of the peace committees, were nomi they were nominated by their institutions into the peace committee. So we then have a process, even when they were identifying their needs, they actually identified capacity building as part of it. So we create a platform where people speak out to say, for us to be able to work better and achieve this mandate, we need one, two, three, four, five. Mm -hmm. But if it comes from them, it becomes sustainable. It's not top down, mm -hmm. but it's driven. Because wh once you drive the agenda, you've got a commitment and interest to seeing it through. Now, of course, we met yesterday with um, Commissioner Masunongore, and it was very interesting for me to want to hear from yourselves how successful have these thematic committees been in terms of conflict uh, prevention and particularly resolution and transformation um i think if you mm, the thematic committee that we are working with the members both from the northern region and the southern region the first thing that i must uh, be grateful for is their commitment. Mm -hmm. This is voluntary. They are not paid by the commission. They give in their time to this work. So the commitment and the bringing in of these ideas to then say, if we structure our work in this way, let's have the peace committee, let's structure our conflict early warning. If, um, how do we come up with a agenda towards conflict transformation within our nation? So in terms of uh, creating uh, the structure that is required for the work of prevention and non recurrence to move. So for us to be able to then start putting in place the peace committees, it's an innovation that is coming out of uh, this thematic committee to say what structures do we need at national and sub-national level. Even as we're working on our conflict early warning, early response, there's a, a conflict early warning, early response subcommittee within this thematic committee that is then researching, looking around, and this is in their own time um, um, with their own commitment to make um, the work move. So we believe that that's really a milestone in terms of the work that uh, the um, thematic committee has done so far. But we are looking forward to greater milestones, especially even as we hope to launch the conflict early warning, early response system 
uh, sometime this year and also to make sure that our district peace committees are running when there are conflicts people have uh, reference points they can talk to the people within their community within their district mm -hmm. and have their conflicts resolved and let me also say that one thing that we are looking at as well is our own traditional mechanisms of conflict resolution okay as a nation or as zimbabweans in terms of our culture what were we doing before before that mm -hmm. works that we can also take on then we have the traditional leaders on board mm -hmm. so that when some of the conflicts come in then they can also advise no in terms of how we relate in terms of our culture either is sona either is ndebele either is kalanga uh, you know in our different um e different ways this is the best way of dealing with this particular issue which is sustainable so that we have a blend in terms of the modern mechanisms but also the traditional mechanisms that produce the results that we have okay so in your conflict resolution do you have experiences perhaps where the, the affected in this situation demands some form of retribution for whatever experiences they've had um so far because that is also part of our healing and reconciliation mm -hmm. program um i think commissioner Nguye will speak to the public hearings that we are working towards where we we'll then have people coming in to say um you know this is what happened mm -hmm. this is what i want but do you think to retribution is a resolution it depends it depends on how we we, we the the two parties see it but our focus as a commission is restoration of relationships because mm -hmm. remember suppose for example you and i have a conflict we take each other to court mm -hmm. you might win i might win but that's the end Mm -hmm. of the relationship that we, we must have. still be neighbors thereafter yeah. yeah so our focus as a commission is to help parties in a conflict to then say if we take this approach what does it mean mm -hmm. but at the end of the day remember we're a victim-centered commission so we are also we will then be guided more by what the victim wants but our focus is to then say we are a peace and reconciliation commission mm -hmm. yes if if retribution is going to help you but how are we then going to help the reconciliation aspect thereafter? So it will really be on a case-by-case -case basis as they come. And we obviously, there will be people who would want retribution as part of the process. We are not going to dismiss that. But how, if, that, if then they get the, the justice that they, they, saw, they think will then bring healing to their soul, we are not ending there. How do we then work more towards Mm -hmm. restoration of relationships which is around conflict transformation now earlier you mentioned how important it is for you to have sustainable resolutions mm -hmm. and it's in those sustainable um, resolutions that we are able to see transformation do you have mechanisms in place by which you monitor and evaluate transformation particularly beyond the lifespan of just NPRC mm -hmm. We are actually working on um, the transformation aspect of um, uh, the work of prevention and non-recurrence. We had to, to take priorities to then say, where do we start off? Where do we go? But we do have a strong m and component within the commission that seeks to then evaluate um, the success or the impact of each and every intervention that that we make so we'll be speaking more to the aspect of conflict transformation as we move with the work of the con commission but it's an area that we've packed for now because we needed to attend to the immediate issues mm -hmm. that we have that we thought in for us in to be able to kick start the major work around prevention and non-recurrence what is it that we need to start off with mm -hmm. but really transformation is an important aspect because if you look at rwanda right now they they transformation also from their conflict within the genocide is what has helped them to move to where where they are now so how do we ensure that we we bring in conflict transformation in terms of the past conflicts that we have from the pre-independence period up to now how do we ensure that there is change in attitudes in behavior in ways of thinking in view of the past that we've had 
which is part of the transformation process. Now, of course, you're commissioner responsible for Manikaland, yes. and during your 21-day outreach program last year, reference was made to conflicts that arose from the Marange Diamond Rush. Yes. Did you have to intervene as a commission? Okay, we, we've been, I think I've been to Chiazu about twice um, so far, and we've had an opportunity to engage with some of the people there in terms of the issues that they have around uh, the displacements, around what happened uh, when the diamond mining started. So it's an issue that we, we are also still um, uh, working on. We've at some point engaged with the diamond mining company as well so that we try and see what conversations do we need to have in mm -hmm. order to come up with lasting solutions to, to, to the complaints or to the conflict that is there now following the movement of people from um, the, the, the diamond mining fields into other areas that they've now been located. And it's also one of the priority issues that the Manika Land Peace Committee has set uh, to, to, look, to look into. Because you find that now other issues are coming up where there are uh, some gold reserves that have also been found in Nyanga. Mm -hmm. And so all these issues keep coming up as then more and more resources, na mineral resources are discovered. So we then need to have a conversation that says how do we come up with sustainable resolutions of this particular conflict. So it's something that we are working on together with the Manikal and Peace And of course, not all conflict can be controlled, yes. <laughs> no, yes. naturally. Some yes. of it is man-made mm -hmm. and some of it is from nature, mm -hmm. as was the case when we experienced Cyclone Idai, of yes. course, displacing people mm -hmm. means there's going to be conflict. Is that a situation that you have had to step in and intervene? Yes, we, we also had the opportunity to go to, to Chimani Mani to try and understand the issues that were there. Is there were complaints around uh, the people who were not wanting to be moved from their areas because they felt that that is where their life was, where that is where they, they buried their relatives mm -hmm. so, so they can't move. So it's also something that we've also been discussing with um, the parties concerned in terms of then how do we do we work around it so that at the end of the day we come up with a uh, sustainable resolution of, of, of that particular issue? And I must say in terms of um, current thinking and current research, um, the field of conflict uh, transformation is also looked at the conflict between men and the environment. Mm -hmm. How do we start thinking around, around those issues uh, as well? So those are new thinkings that are coming in that we are also researching into as a thematic committee to then say how do we work around the issues of climate change and 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 conflict um if you look at the theme um the un theme for the international day of peace last year it was climate action for peace mm -hmm. to try and show then how do we work around issues of climate change as part of the peace building uh process so it's a new area uh, that we are also working around and trying to understand in terms of uh, how we can do that. Also, uh, in addition to that, the issues of conflict and technology. How do we use technologies to for peace building rather than to enhance conflict as is currently happening now? So there's always a lot of um, research that needs to be happening also with the help of our research and knowledge management um, thematic committee, Commissioner Andoro will speak to that as well. Yeah. Now, of course, we've <laughs> been under lockdown since March 30th, yes. a very stressful time mm -hmm. for Indeed. everyone. Mm -hmm. And just yesterday, um, Commissioner Masanangura made reference to some of the challenges mm -hmm. that they've been experiencing with regards to the lockdown as a thematic committee. What are your experiences so far as conflict prevention and management? Okay, uh, yeah, so when the, the lockdown was announced, we, we sat down and said, obviously, there will be areas for p potential conflict that, mm. that might come up. So we had a small task force that was on standby that was also assessing the situation in terms of areas of potential conflict. And that also helped to activate the complaints handling mechanism mm -hmm. of the commission. Because we are seeing that there were issues that were popping up within the communities that we live in terms of what was happening in the water points, um, what was happening in terms of 
our law enforcement agencies, they also they were trying to enforce the lockdown, what were some of the issues that were coming up. So we, as part of the prevention process, we activated the complaints handling, but we also activated um, a, a, a platform where we then engage with the different stakeholders, also giving them updates, the police, this is what we are getting, so that we are all, all in the loop in terms of then how do we work together to make sure that we don't have unnecessary escalations of, of violence which might then happen because of the situation that we are in. And also s one of the things that we are proposing with our Victim Support Gender and Diversity Committee is to then say, uh, in addition to monitoring the situation, what interventions can we make for people who are stressed, who might mm. want to be able to talk to someone because if you call 2019 2023 those two free numbers are specifically for COVID issues but i might just be locked down i might have not have a COVID issue but i might be stressed mm -hmm. and that affects peace from an individual perspective and also peace made within the home and the immediate community mm -hmm. so we are working on activating also two free numbers that can produce then provide psychosocial support to some of the people that might just need to make a call and talk to someone, this is what I'm going through. So those have been some of the experiences. And these are recommendations also that are arising from some of the stakeholders that we interact with to then say, we think there is a gap here that needs uh, to be managed. Because one of the um, um, mandate of the commission is also to ensure that a treatment support is given mm -hmm. to people who are affected by different pandemics. So I might not be affected directly by the COVID, but indirectly in terms of my um, personal stresses, I might be affected. So how do we then provide support mm -hmm. to such people? Of course, now you mentioned issues of food distribution, of water collection points, and all of those have been greatly politicized, mm -hmm. unfortunately. How have you had to step in as a thematic committee with regards to politics spilling over at a time like this? I think for, for us, the, the fortunate bit is that we have direct uh, lines of communication with the different representatives of the political parties because they are part of our peace committees. Mm -hmm. So then that becomes, that makes it easier to then sometimes intervene, you know, through co calling your colleagues and saying, this is what is happening, this mm -hmm. is what the people are saying. You know, as people are writing the names for uh, support, well for support, they are writing people from the political parties. What do we do? Mm -hmm. You know, so then, and this has helped in in some in most of the instances where then you know those people who were then saying we are not getting access to be registered, we facilitated their registration because we we are engaging. Obviously, the the response that you beg you some sometimes get is different. No, that is not what is actually happening on the ground. But also because people don't have access to information, mm -hmm. they might not know of what the actual processes are. And then we also encourage the different stakeholders to properly share information so that um, people know what to do, when, and how. So we work mo mostly around engagement. You know, sometimes because you have been working with these people in a different committees. You just sometimes it's just a quick phone call to say, you know what, this is what is happening. Can we resolve it? What do we do? And then you get back to the affected people and get it done. Now, you've said that your biggest focus is to intervene before matters escalate. And I don't think there have ever been instances of escalation of conflict that have moved faster and more fiercely than political lines across this country. Mm dating back as far as time immemorial, I suppose. And how would you say you've been a helping hand in reconfiguring how conflict is dealt with within the different political spaces that we have? Um, I think, first of all, we've had the opportunity to have bilateral engagements with the political parties. Mm -hmm. In terms of, first of all, them understanding our mandate, us hearing also in terms of what their expectations, in terms of what how things can be done. So that has been one of the first steps that we've done. And then secondly, by incorporating them within our peace committees, they can also hear from what the communities are saying mm -hmm. about the political situation so that they can also then make a commitment. Because remember, it's the same communities 
who are their voters at the end of the and day. And like you rightfully said, sustainable yeah. solutions. Yes. So th by them being part of the, the, the our peace committees, mm. it's then to help make sure that issues are directed to them in their presence mm -hmm. and they can be discussed and they can make commitments. But we are also working on, we've discussed with uh, the representatives in our thematic committee on conflict prevention around how do we promote um, engagement um, amongst the political parties themselves. Mm -hmm. um, before I joined the commission, I, maybe if I may just mention, I worked with Jomik. And this was an inter-party dialogue where the political parties met and discussed issues. So we are then saying, how do we then m make sure that there is some kind of discussion or interaction amongst the political parties themselves outside of the Peace Committee? So there's a program that we are currently developing specifically for political parties, because it's also there in the mandate to say, facilitate dialogue amongst the political mm -hmm. parties. That is actually the first statement in that, mm -hmm. in that function. So we've discussed areas of possibilities that we can work around in terms of how do we bring the political parties together. Obviously, there's a lot of uh, bilateral engagement that we need to do mm -hmm. so that there is really, we are sufficiently sure that we are agreed on what the program is and how it should move forward. Because if they, if they bring more input into the program, it becomes easier for them to be committed to the process. And like you said before, there's no time limit on how long it will take to resolve it. Mm -hmm. But the idea is eventually complete transformation yes. is where we are coming from. Do you feel like transformation is an achievable dream? It is. It is. It will take. It will take years, and I think then we then have to set milestones mm -hmm. around transformation, to so that we are then able to say maybe within the first five years what has changed, what is not, or the first two years what has changed, what is not, mm -hmm. uh, where did we miss it, why, what were the challenges, how do we improve? So you then have to take incremental steps. You know, one drop at a time, one drop at a time. Ant until you get there. Uh, and remember, we are saying as a commission, our vision is a peaceful Zimbabwe for all generations. So we are not just mm -hmm. talking about our generation, but we also owe it to the generations that are coming ahead of us. Oh, thank you so much for that. You have been watching State of the Nation, and our discussion today was the NPRC Visibility and Awareness Campaign focusing on conflict prevention, management, resolution, and transformation. I'd like to thank our panelists today for joining us, Commissioner Patience Chiraza. This broadcast was brought to you by Zimpefa's Television Network. And of course, for all your comments and views on our show today, contact us via our Facebook page, Zimpefa's TV Network, or via our Twitter handle, at ZTN News. Thanks for watching.